My name is Graham Jackson. I am a tax partner at Hassan's. I specialise in international taxation and uh, with a specific angle of treaties and uh, information exchange. And as we have this uh, UK Gibraltar DTA now, <clears throat> we did do some sessions very early on, myself, but uh, I thought that, you know, now things had settled down, we could have a look at the, a slightly more practical approach. So instead of, we're not going to review, I'm not going to review every single article and give you a full overarching idea of the treaty. We're going to go through the ones that we think would be, I think would be relevant to you. And then we're going to talk about um, any issues that arise. But also we're going to include what is it that treaties are for? Because I think it's uh, it's important to understand that. So, Gibraltar has um, got the UK uh, the UK double taxation treaty in force, and it's important to understand that this treaty follows the model of the OECD model tax convention. So that is an that is a global standard of international tax conventions. The language in, these, in this treaty is subject to extensive commentary published <coughs> by the OECD. And you can go and find out what these words mean by looking at the, at, at the commentary. And I suggest that everybody does if they're gonna uh, work with the commentary, work with the treaty, sorry, um, on a regular basis. Can everybody check that they're, they're on mute? Because I'm, I'm hearing some heavy breathing. Um, okay. So when we interpret, it's, it's important to understand that when we interpret a, a we not interpret a treaty in accordance with the normal literal approach, which is so beloved of lawyers uh, in the common law, we have to look at it with a purposive approach, and that's in uh, the case law of Memec and uh, Commerce Bank, we have to take a purposive approach. What is the objective of the, tr of the language? We have to have clear regard for the fact that the language of the treaty is not drafted by legal draftsmen, it's drafted by treaty draftsmen, and they are doing a different job to somebody who is drafting a piece of legislation, even though it does have legislative effect in some cases. So you, you look at the treaty, and if the treaty isn't clear, you go and look at the commentary. <clears throat> and we have to have uh, regard to Article 31 of the Vienna Convention on Treaties, which says a treaty should be interpreted in good faith in accordance with the ordinary meaning of the terms of the treaty. So there's no fancy, no fancy terminology, um, accountancy terminology or legal terminology. It's the ordinary meaning of the words that we're looking at, and we're looking at what the purpose of the language is trying to achieve. So I put, my last bullet point is there, we should assume that be taxed in the territory of residence of the entity or the individual, unless the treaty says otherwise. So how does the treaty work? Let's go right back to basics. What are double taxation treaties? What do they do, right? So where you have people dealing across territories, you end up with a clash between the right of a jurisdiction to tax income which is sourced within their territory and the right of a jurisdiction to tax in individuals and entities on a worldwide basis if they are resident in that jurisdiction. So where you have a resident of one jurisdiction with sourced income in another jurisdiction, there is a clash between those two rights. And that would result in that individual or entity being taxed twice now, the treaty deals with that in two ways. There is a structural method and a tiebreaker method. The structural method is by allocating taxing rights for different types of income to different jurisdictions. So we'll see that immovable property, income from immovable property is taxed in the jurisdiction where the property is, and then the resident's jurisdiction is obliged to give a tax relief, a, a, a double taxation relief for that tax paid in the jurisdiction of the location of the property. So let's imagine it, 
a Gibraltar individual has rental property in the UK. He rents that property out. That property is the in, that rent is taxable in the UK. If there is any Gibraltar tax, then Gibraltar is obliged to give a relief for the UK tax. So that's how we allocate uh, taxing rights, sometimes exclusively, sometimes non-exclusively. But that structure means that it's no, no longer possible to have um, taxation. Also, what it does is it has tiebreakers for dual residents. So you can imagine somebody, because if anybody who understands the UK statutory residence test will understand it is not a simple thing out, it's quite complex. Um, so somebody could easily be resident in the UK and also resident in Gibraltar, and you need to break a tie between that, between that so that you can correctly allocate taxing rights to the resident jurisdiction or to the source jurisdiction. And thirdly, it facilitates information exchange. There's an information exchange article down at the bottom in the 20s, which, which basically provides a framework for us to exchange information. And it is one of the legal gateways that we do um, information exchange like DAX6 and um, information exchange on request. It does the job of the tier that we used to have. You know, we've got all those tiers. Uh, it, it's not so relevant now because exchange is not the it's not the, the preferred method. The multilateral information exchange is the preferred method. Now, it is predicated to treaties. The OECD model convention is predicated on each jurisdiction taxing both source and residents on a worldwide basis. We do not tax our companies on a worldwide basis, apart from in some circumstances. So it is um, predicated on that. And you'll see some things and you think, oh, I'm not really sure why that's relevant to us, but it's because we've got the model treaty and that's the way it works. That was one of the arguments that was made. It wasn't me that was somebody else pointed out. <laughs> one of the arguments that was made with the Spanish, why the Spanish agreement is so best spoke is that um, model treaties don't apply very well to us, but obviously our negotiating partner in the UK wanted the model treaty because this is almost identical to the one that the Isle of Man have got, and Guernsey and Jersey have got. We've got an exactly standard CDOT um, treaty and Spain wanted a, a best spoke treaty. So obviously there has to be agreement and that's how we get it. So, and, but the, and the last point, which is very important on this slide, is the treaty overrides domestic law. If the treaty says that um, Gibraltar cannot tax a, cer a certain source of income, then Gibraltar cannot tax that income regardless of the domestic legislation. It is overridden by the treaty. So, who does the treaty apply to? Well, the treaty applies to resident, all residents of the two territories in question. It's defined in Article 4. We'll talk about that later. But it is any persons who are resident of one or both territories. It is not only those who are resident in both territories. I have seen that written down. That's not correct. Because you can be resident in one territory and have income in another territory, and that is covered by the treaty. So, what is a person? That's a good question. So, an individual, this is Article 1, it's an individual, a company, or any other body of persons. So, a person is a person and lots of things that aren't persons, but generally a tax unit would probably be a decent, uh, decent way of expressing it. And what does resident mean? Well, this is contained in Article 4. And we'll talk about it in more detail later. Any person liable to tax by virtue of their domicile, residence, place of management, place of incorporation, or similar in a jurisdiction. So if you are obliged to pay tax in Gibraltar, because you are because you are ordinarily resident in Gibraltar, then you are a resident for the purpose of the treaty. However, the treaty test 
is not the same as the domestic test in section 74. You need to consider whether you are resident for the treaty, not simply ask, am I tax resident under the Income Tax Act? Because there is more language to the residence test in the treaty in Article 4 than there is simply in the uh, Income Tax Act. Now, it does not include person, a person who is liable to pay tax in respect of only income or gains from sources in that territory, and that's aiming at permanent establishments, which we'll talk about later, and it does not include persons who are fiscally transparent. So you can qualify as a person under Article 1, but if you are fiscally transparent, that is a partnership, a... So let's go with a partnership, or, or, or in some cases, a cricket club, or a, a, a football club, some sort of association, unincorporated association is the word I'm looking for, then you would be a person for the purposes of Article 1, but you would not be resident for the purposes of Article 4. So a partnership cannot access the treaty benefits because it does not, it's, an, it's, it's a general partnership, specifically I'm talking about, I know there are some issues around other kinds of partnerships, but a general partnership cannot be treaty resident. Uh, limited liability partnership is, is, is fiscally transparent as well. So what taxes does it cover? Well, in Gibraltar, it covers income tax and the corporation tax. Obviously, they're wrapped up in the same legislation and essentially the same thing. In UK taxes, it covers income tax, corporation tax, and capital gains tax. So we need to understand this does not cover inheritance tax in the UK. It doesn't cover national insurance in the UK. It doesn't cover ATAD. It doesn't cover uh, the banking levy and any of those other things. It's or SDLT. It simply covers income tax, corporation tax, capital gains tax. So let's go through the residence tiebreakers because these are very different to the tiebreakers that we've seen in the Spanish agreement. So where a person is resident in both jurisdictions, in order to work out which jurisdiction they are resident for, for the purposes of the treaty, that's the allocating of the taxing rights between the different jurisdictions, then you need to apply the tiebreakers, which are contained in Article 4. In the case of individuals, an individual will be deemed resident in the territory where he has his permanent home. First, if he has no permanent home, then he is deemed resident in the place to which his personal and economic relations are closer. And that's what we know of as the centre of vital interests test. And if there is no centre of vital interests ascertainable, or he has no permanent home in either territory, then he is deemed resident where he has an habitual abode. And that sounds very similar, permanent home, but it isn't. If you repeatedly go to a place habitually, and you and and that's your your um your the place where you uh, habitually abide i think it's wider than home um then that will be your place of residence and finally if he has an habitual abode in both territories then the competent authorities will settle the question by mutual agreement so there is an acknowledgement that you might not be able to work it out and if you can't work it out they sit around a table and they discuss it. It's not so much of a problem for us, I don't think, with the fact that we are, what is it, 1,500 miles away from the UK, but if you were the, you were the Isle of Man or you were, um, you were the Channel Islands, that might be, it might, you might get to a point where you just couldn't work it out. And then people, then the authorities will sit down, and they will have a conversation and it will be a, um, probably a brutal and, and, and uncomfortable one for both sides, and they will come to a decision. Importantly, if they can't come to a decision, you, you are not, you're disallowed the treaty benefits. There is no obligation on them to settle this. They will try. All they have to do is do their best. If they can't come to a conclusion, the treaty does not apply to you. So now that's individuals. So let's look at... Um, corporates and non-individuals. So there is no hierarchy of tests for corporates. They simply look at the mutual agreement procedure, but they are, they are sort of pointed at 
some relevant things that they need to consider. So they will consider, firstly, the place of effective management. Now, that's important to understand that that is not the same as management and control. Otherwise, it wouldn't be an effective tiebreaker between Gibraltar and the UK, because we both have the same test. Um, it's more expansive than that. I talked about this before. It's sort of more a, a around the, the place where the day-to-day -day operations of the company, the day-to-day -day decision making is taken, whereas uh, central management control is the place where the top level strategic thinking is taken. And whilst they will generally be the same place, they are not necessarily the same place. Secondly, they will consider the place of incorporation, but I'm not sure how much weight that will have. Um, and then they will think about any other relevant factors. So that's just a, a, a catch-all. They will just discuss whatever's relevant in each individual case-by-case -case analysis. So that's the tiebreakers. We understand that you, so in order for the tiebreaker to apply, you must first meet the residence test in both jurisdictions, and then you apply the tiebreaker to, to split the difference. So let's see if we can imagine a place where you would be resident in both places. Under Article 4, for residency, sorry, I'm flicking like this. Under Article 4, the residency where you are resident, here it is, sorry, any person liable to tax by virtue of their residence, place of management, place of incorporation, etc. Well, in my understanding, uh, a company in Gibraltar is obliged to pay tax on its intercompany interest by virtue of its place of registration is the word, but it's, it's similar to place of incorporation. And then its place of management could be in the UK. So it would trigger in both places. Then you go to the, um, the tiebreaker, which is the mutual agreement procedure for non-residents. For, for, for non-individuals, sorry. So that's how you work out where the, in, where the individual or the co company is resident. It's important because when we get to the meat of the treaty, the allocation articles, we'll see that some of them are allocated to the source jurisdiction and some of them are allocated to the residence jurisdiction. So, this is a list of most of the ones that are relevant. There are more. I'm not going to talk about all of these because I don't want to take up too much time, but we can just bounce through them. So income from immovable property is allocated to the source jurisdiction in the first instance. So you'll see if you look at the treaty that the articles are generally written in terms of uh, the jurisdiction of source may tax, not may only tax. So what you'll get um, where, you, where you have source is the lower tax jurisdiction. Tax will be paid there, and then a top up will be paid in the, um, in the jurisdiction of residence. So source allocation for Article 6, immovable property. Article 7 is business profits. Now, that is an, that is an exclusive residence only. So it says when jurisdiction uh, uh, has income which arises in a in the other jurisdiction it may only be taxed in the in the residence jurisdiction unless the business is carried out through what's called a permanent establishment and we'll come down to it further down so that means that under the treaty a Gibraltar uh, a UK entity can have income which is accrued and derived in Gibraltar as a business profit and it will not be taxable in Gibraltar unless they have a permanent establishment here. Okay, so Article 8, international shipping, air and transport, is a residence subject to withholding. So that's where the residence, the residence jurisdiction is, um, is the primary taxation allocation, but then a withholding tax is permitted on the payments coming out of the source jurisdiction. Similarly with dividends, interest and royalties. We'll get onto, onto how that works later on. And then capital gains, it really depends on the, on the type of capital, uh, capital gain and they pretty much mirror 
the uh, the other articles, but it's it's sort of sweeping up capital gains. You need to if you've got capital gains that arise in the UK, you need to think about uh, what that article says. Income from employment is um, allocated to source unless it, it, only if the employment is exercised in that other jurisdiction. So it's about where is the. It's very odd to say the source can be the place where you don't do the employment. But I think what they're trying to say is in order to avoid any argument, if your employer is in one jurisdiction and you're doing the job in another jurisdiction, then it is, it, it's where you do the job that matters. Article 15 is director's fees and that's allocated to the source jurisdiction. Article 16, artists and sportsmen is allocated to the source jurisdiction. And you'll know that we have in Gibraltar some specific um, sections in our income tax act that deal with this in the uh, not in the income tax act in the um, allowances deductions and exemptions regulations and article 17 is pensions taxed at source and anybody who works in the world of pure ops will understand how that works so i'm not going to talk about all of those articles i'm just going to talk about the articles that you're going to run into on a daily basis hopefully if if, if trade works as well as it does is supposed to under the treaty, then uh, these are the articles that you need to be worried about in particular. Article seven discusses business profits. So the starting point is that profits of an enterprise resident in a territory will only be taxable in that territory. So again, let's look at our UK uh, example. UK business is has Gibraltar sourced income. That income is only taxable in the UK unless the enterprise carries on a business in the other territory through a permanent establishment. Then the, per the profits attributable to that permanent establishment are taxable in Gibraltar. This is not really a concept that we ever really used to struggle with. We used to talk about branches and places of business and that was really a registration issue rather than anything else because we just taxed on a, on a crude and derived basis. You can even imagine that the UK business sends a man to do things in somebody else's offices. He's not fixed, and we'll talk about permanent, but he wouldn't need to fix permanent place of business. And that is not taxable in Gibraltar anymore. Now, doesn't give them any advantage because it's all going to be taxable in the UK at a rate that's higher than ours. Um, but it just needs to be understood that this is how the treaty works. That is the way it is designed to work. And that is the way that all treaties which follow the OECD model convention work. So the permanent establishment will be expected to make the profits which are attributable to it as if it were a separate enterprise. So we have a permanent establishment how we get one of those, we'll talk about it now. But it it will it's treated as a taxation fiction, and it will have profits attributed to it that would be attributed to a separate enterprise with the same functions and assets used, risks assumed by the enterprise through the permanent establishment. So you treat the permanent establishment as if um, it is a separate entity. So. What is a permanent establishment? Well, we have two types of permanent establishment. The first is what's called a fixed place of business. This is all contained in Article 5, if you have a look at it. A fixed place of business, which is um, a, which includes, but it's not an exhaustive list, a place of management, a branch, an office, a factory, a workshop, a mine or well or other form of extraction, or a building site of more than 12 months. So that's a real place. So you need to have a real place before you can have a permanent establishment. Now you can also have what's called an agency permanent establishment. This is where a person other than an independent agent acting in the ordinary course of their business habitually exercises authority to conclude contracts in the name of the enterprise. So also need to know that it's not just about concluding contracts. If somebody negotiates the contracts, does all the work, hands it off to the directors, they rubber stamp it, they never query it, then it is as good as he or she has concluded that contract. So 
you can have an agency PE, you can have a fixed place of business PE, fixed place of business PE. And what happens then is that the PE is treated as if it is a separate entity for tax purposes. It needs to prepare accounts. It needs to file a tax return. It may well need to register if it's a fixed place of business. And it needs any, every time, this is the, the little weird thing in the tale, every time it interacts with its head office, i.e. The, the company um, that it's a part of, it needs to, it's deemed to make a charge for any services it provides as if at arm's length in accordance with the correct pricing that the market would give it. And it's also deemed to be charged as if at arm's length in accordance with the correct pricing, which, would, which the market would give it. So it's very, very complicated if you've got a permanent establishment because you have essentially got for tax purposes an entirely separate entity. Now, just a word of caution around the agency PE. Let's imagine a different situation where we've got a JIBCO and somebody in the UK who is a consultant. They have a consultancy agreement. They sign the consultancy agreement. Everything is good. They go and they negotiate things and then they come back and they recommend them to the directors. Hey, that's good. That protects management and control. It protects the tax residents of the company in Gibraltar. But if, it is, if, the, if that person is not doing that in the ordinary course of their business of being an agent, so in other words, they have more than one customer that aren't related, yeah, and they are essentially just passing documents for approval, then that creates a taxable presence in the UK, and everything that's attributable to the contracts that they negotiate is taxable in the UK because there's a permanent establishment in the UK. So it really needs to be considered how these consultancy agreements operate. The directors need to exercise real control. The people who, the consultants need to understand that it's the directors that are in control and that they are the ones that would be pushing back. Um, so thank you, Nigel. Yes, you've, you've, you've You've asked a question about probably topical, but does home working from another jurisdiction create a P after a certain number of days? Well, there has to be an element of permanence. It's in the name. There has to be an element of permanence. And you need to, that we are in a particularly odd time and the OECD has recommended to its members that they don't apply PE rules to people who are stuck, literally stuck, See, this is the problem. Literally stuck is what the OECD have recommended. Cannot fly. If you've just got somebody sitting at home in Belgium and you're in Luxembourg and it's just, it is possible for them to go to work, but you take a conservative approach. I'm not sure that the OECD guidance would help there. I also know that the Spanish have generally rejected the OECD guidance on this. And I think that's probably what we're driving at from a topical perspective. I think that every single entity which has people sitting in their offices, sitting in their homes in another jurisdiction right now, where, the, where they can cross the, whichever border it is that we're talking about, should be reviewing, do we, are we in danger of having a permanent establishment in the other jurisdiction? Because permanent establishments don't just apply to the UK. They are a global concept. Pretty much everybody has it. And... Um, it should be kept under constant review and we should be making sure that these things do not become permanent. There is no minimum, well, there is no minimum number of days, but if you're only doing it for a week, it's not permanent, is it? But if you're doing it for 12 months, then it depends on a case by case. There is no pure arithmetic um, answer to that question. So that's where we are, especially if you've got top level directors sitting in, sitting in another country. Um, executing contracts. So that's what a permanent establishment is. Permanent establishments are a big worry. Um, you need to be very conscious of them and you need to be careful not to trigger them. They are part of most countries' domestic law anyway. This uh, definition is part of most domestic law around the world that I've seen anyway. So you need to be very conscious of, is my arrangement at risk of creating a permanent establishment? even if it protects my tax residents. 
So you need to, it should be full tax advice should be taken for any arrangement that has somebody negotiating contracts in another country. And it should be taken in that country. So let's just give you some good news. What is not a permanent establishment? Well, facilities used solely for display, storage or delivery of goods, maintenance of stock or deliver display, etc., maintenance of stock for processing by someone else, a purchasing or information collection office, a fixed place of business for things that are preparatory or auxiliary in character, and any combination of the above, as long as it remains auxiliary or preparatory. So I think we can all see there um, how large internet companies manage to make sure that they don't establish a permanent establishment in all the countries that they operate in, or that they have warehouses in specifically. Um, anyway, so what is the effect of a PE to go into slightly more detail? All income attributable to the permanent establishment will be taxed in the location of the permanent establishment. The permanent establishment is a fiction of a separate entity and the permanent establishment will be obliged to register in its jurisdiction for tax. It will be obliged to prepare accounts. It will be obliged to file a tax return in its jurisdiction. And the interactions between the parent and the PE must be done as if at arm's length. But let me just give you an example that I think is, is overlooked. Mrs. Smith sits in her bedroom in UK, right? And she's employed by a Gibraltar company. And Mrs. Smith always sits in her bedroom in UK doing the work. And she delivers her employment in that place. And it is fixed. She never goes anywhere else. And she executes contracts. But she doesn't generate any income. So she's executing buying contracts, say. She's not generating any income. Feels like there's no UK sourced income. But the truth is that because the permanent establishment is a separate entity for tax purposes, and when it interacts with its head office in JIB, it is deemed to charge the services of Mrs. Smith to head office at arm's length prices, then there is income in the UK that needs to have tax paid on it. And I think that you need to think if you're operating businesses like that, you need to think, is there something I need to worry about here? Have we got local advice? Is this how PEs work in Romania or in um, Turkey or in wherever the business is? So you need to be very cautious of permanent establishments. And I think I could probably just do a talk on permanent establishments, but uh, this concept is very important. It's not just in the concept of treaties. So let's bounce through the articles quickly. So Article 6 is income from a movable property. Income may be taxed in the territory where the property is located. Note, may be taxed, not may only be taxed. There's no real change here. Um, the UK would tax income from property under the non-resident landlord scheme or now under the uh, corporation tax regime. And it would also tax capital gains under NRCGT. Uh, Gibraltar would always have taxed any income which is accrued and derived in Gibraltar, i.e. from JIB property, regardless of the location of the individual. So no change, I don't think, uh, though if you've got, no, there's no change because everything would have always been taxed in the same way. Article 10, dividends. Well, dividends paid by a company to a resident in the other country can be taxed in the other country. They can also be taxed in the territory of residents of the issuing entity. So this is residents plus withholding. However, the UK doesn't have dividend withholding at the moment, uh, but it is there if they want to use it. And um, it is capped. The beneficial owner of the dividend has to be, so the beneficial owner of the dividend, so not, it's not a, 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 bad, a nominee is not sufficient to trigger that, um, is a resident of the receiving territory, then the dividend will be tax-free in the issuing territory unless the dividend is paid by what's known as a REIT. The dividend is defined very widely, includes any non-debt claim, anything which is a participation in profits. So that is a profit, profit, profit participation. Sometimes we call them profit participation loans. That would need a strict analysis of the document as it is. Because sometimes people call them loans, but they're not loans. Sometimes people structure them as loans. 
um, when actually it might act, may be better to structure them as pure future profit purchases. Um, so it's a, it, that's a matter for, for thought. And if anybody wants to have a chat with me about that, that's cool. So Article 11, interest. So interest arising in, and I'm going to I'm going to stop saying in a territory in the other territory. I'm going to put the names in. It's much easier to understand. So interest arising in UK and beneficially owned by a resident of Gibraltar may be taxed in Gibraltar, or interest arising in Gibraltar and beneficially owned by a resident of UK may be taxed in UK. It may also be taxed in the paying jurisdiction, so Gibraltar or UK, depending on where the other guy is, it arises in unless the interest is beneficially owned by either the state of the, of the territory, an individual, a listed and traded entity, a company less than 25% owned by non-residents, a, a pension scheme, a bank or building society, any other unconnected financial institution, any other person entity signed off by the authorities in, in the relevant territories where the interest arises. So there is withholding on interest being paid out of the UK at 20%. If you have a Gibraltar company that has lent money to a UK company and all the other rules of source are met, we're going to talk about in a minute, all those other rules are met, then you, uh, you can apply to be relieved of that withholding if you meet these criteria. There is a form. There is a form. And you need to get that stamped by the authorities here. And you submit it to HMRC. And then the person paying you the interest is entitled to stop withholding the 20%. And this similar rule applies to royalties. Royalties arising in the UK and beneficially owned by a resident of Gibraltar or arising in Gibraltar and beneficially owned by a resident of the UK may be taxed in the other territory. It may also be taxed in the territory it arises in unless and the same tests for interest are um, applied. Interesting to note, that royalties are not necessarily what we always call royalties. There's some issue around license fees and royalties and um, license fees can be business profits. That's a technical piece and um, you should take advice if you think that it might be relevant to you. So let's have a quick look at the, um, the treaty claim. You fill in this form, you request a certificate. What is the subject, what is subject to you to withholding tax? Well, it's UK sourced royalty payments. I think that will be quite clear. And it's UK sourced interest. Now the interest source is a complex test. And people are going to get agitated when I say the next sentence. But if the loan is made to a UK person and it is not secured against anything and there are no other relevant factors, then HMRC will expect to see withholding tax either withheld from the payment at 20% or exempted from the payment. Now, that test has been talked about, National Bank of Greece. There is a newer case called Ardmore and Perrin, which points to the fact that um, the, the application of the National Bank of Greece test that we used to do here in Gibraltar 10 years ago is under, uh, 20, 15 years ago before the 2010 Act, is under some doubt. Um, it, in its nuances, whereas what we used to say was we used to say all of the multi-factors had to be present. Ardmore and Perrin point very strongly to any one of the multi-factors can override all the others, but it depends on a case-by-case -case analysis. So whilst all factors have equal strength, conceptually, it is most likely, I find, on the facts that the residents of the debtor will be the most common factor which has influence, not that it is the primary factor or in any way the only thing you look for. So Article 15 is director's fees. Director's fees and other similar payments paid from a company resident in Territory A, Gibbs to a person resident in 
UK are taxable in Territory A and vice versa. Jane is a Gibraltarian, director of Allied Capital Fund Limited, which is a hedge fund, hedge fund tax, uh, local tax resident in UK. UK may tax Jane on her director's fees, and she should take advice and file a return if required. So all of those people who are directors of entities in the UK and get paid for it, who are tax residents in Gibraltar, should be considering their position. Article 22, how do we eliminate dual taxation? Well, the words of the, this section is divided into the Gibraltar bit and the UK bit, and the words are entirely different, but they both mean the same thing. So uh, Gibraltar will include the assessable income of its residents, all income which may have been taxed by the UK in accordance with the agreement. And then Gibraltar will allow a deduction to the lower level of the Gibraltar tax payable or the tax paid in UK. So you can get, if you if you owe Gibraltar 10 pounds, if you have 100 pounds of income and UK has taken 20 pounds off you and you owe Gibraltar 10 pounds on that income because you've got 100 pounds worth of income, then they will give you a credit for 10 pounds. They will not give you a credit for 20 pounds. And HMRC's approach is the same. Um, it's a credit method. Now, Article 24, the mutual avoidance, uh, mutual agreement, my apologies, mutual agreement procedure, or as it's also known, the mutual disagreement procedure. Taxpayer can present a complaint under the treaty within three years of the action which led to tax being charged. If the authority complaint cannot resolve the matter itself, it must endeavor to resolve the matter by agreement with the other, th other authority, and the authorities will endeavor to resolve any difficulties or doubts arising from interpretation of the treaty. Endeavor is not must. So they will try. And if they don't manage it, all that happens is you, the taxpayer, lose your treaty protection. It's important to understand these treaties are not in the original form that came about in 1927. The concept of the treaty was not to protect taxpayers. It was to facilitate trade and to protect jurisdictions. Uh, and if anybody wants to read the first, the first iteration of a double taxation treaty, a model treaty, it was uh, 1927 League of Nations published a, an interesting report. I know I am very sad. So at Articles 24 and 26, we have exchange of information and mutual assistance. There's nothing that you that you haven't already seen. This is pretty much what was in place under the EU. It shouldn't, um, it shouldn't, it shouldn't uh, bother anybody. We've lived with this kind of thing for a very long time. Uh, though it is important to understand there are anti-treaty shopping provisions so you cannot engineer getting treaty benefit if you do then having regard to all the relevant facts and circumstances obtaining the benefit was one of the principal purposes of any arrangement or transaction that resulted directly or indirectly in that benefit that benefit can be withdrawn no benefit is a right um, if you are deliberately engineering having that benefit. So another important thing that we need to understand is that transfer pricing is everywhere through this. Transfer pricing is the implementation of the arm's length principle. That is that two connected entities or individuals, or persons, enterprises, whatever you want to call it, two connected persons doing business together must charge each other the market price for the services or the one making the payment is not allowed the deduction. It is applicable to all of um, interest royalties, other income. It's applicable when a permanent establishment deals with its head office and in general in Gibraltar, it is applicable in accordance with section 40 brackets 3 of the Income Tax Act 2010, 
that the, uh, the commissioner's anti-avoidance rule of powers are informed by the OECD transfer pricing guidelines. We have never really had an active transfer pricing um, community here. So I fully expect transfer pricing studies to become more common. I don't think that's just because of the treaty. I think that's because that's the way the world is moving. Um, I think that clients are going to have to understand that they need to spend money on transfer pricing if they expect to receive a tax allow a tax deduction for an expense because authorities are only becoming more aggressive and more uh, strict in their implementation. So that's the end of the session. If you are interested in any of the concepts that we've seen here, then you can find a lot of them being talked about in the podcast that I've done with, um, with a lady called Harriet Brown from Old Square Chambers in London. We discussed the corporate residence rules we discussed personal residence and we discussed permanent establishments and, and other treaty concepts in there. And we, all, and we also do domicile, just to throw that in there because it's, uh, it's, not, it's, it's an odd, uh, odd concept. So you will find more information there. I, I really do think that uh, we should be educating ourselves around these international tax concepts as well as possible because Gibraltar is going to run into them more and more often in the coming years. So now I'm going to stop recording.